magnifying the great God that we serve. Hallelujah. And so we're going to get into the word of God. Amen. Stand to your feet at this particular time and get your wonderful weapon in your hand as we prepare ourselves to go forward with our Bible declaration on this morning. I know this is something that we do uh, on a consistent basis in the house of the Lord. And sometimes when you do stuff, often you take it for granted. And you don't really think about what it is that you're saying. You're just saying it because just that's what we do. But as you lift your weapon in the air today, I want you to think about what it is that you're actually saying as we go forward with our Bible declaration on this morning. Amen? So let us declare. This is my Bible. This is my sword. My instructions for life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I shall hear it, receive it, apply it, and obey it. Share it with others who don't know the way. My heart is open, so have your way. Speak to me, Lord. Speak today. In Jesus' name. I'll never be the same. Speak to me, Lord. Speak today. Dear Father, we just come to you, Lord. We ask that you continue to be with us in the midst of this service. Speak to our hearts. Allow us to receive what it is that you desire to impart into us on this morning. Father, in the midst of everything that's said and done, we want you alone to be glorified. We thank you. We love you. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord, and as you're taking your seat, I want you to open up your Bibles to John chapter 16. John chapter 16 is what I want us to look at on this morning. I'm reading from the New King, King James Version of the Bible, of course, unless otherwise noted. Uh, New King James Version, John chapter 16, and we're going to start at verse 5. When you get the word, say, I have the word. I have the word. Amen, amen. John chapter 16, verse 5. And the word of God says, But now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, Where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin. They do not believe in me of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. For he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take a mine and declare it to you. I put a lot of emphasis on what word? He. He. Who is the he? Jesus. The Holy Spirit. If you're reading this passage of spirit, a, a, a scripture, you will see that the he that it is referring to is the Holy Spirit. And the title of today's message is He Wants Control. Huh. He Wants Control. Hmm. Last week, believers were celebrating Pentecost, amen, which was a pivotal moment in the book of Acts, amen, on that particular day. As I said before, Pentecost was something that took place yearly. But 
in the book of Acts, we saw that it was a special moment unlike any other day of Pentecost, amen? Because that is the day when believers receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. We could not receive what was needed until the Christ had departed. We could not receive the Holy Spirit that we needed so much until Christ had departed. He said in the scripture that we just looked at, he said, it is to your advantage that I go away. Ooh, right there, that's something right there to preach all by itself. Because how many of y'all know it's to your advantage that some people go away? Huh? It's to your advantage, for real, that some people go away. And so he said, it's to your advantage that I go away. So Christ referred to the Holy Spirit as the helper. When you think about the helper, a helper is a person or thing that helps or gives assistance or support. A helper makes it easier for someone to do something. We need the Holy Spirit's help to live this new life in Christ so that we can do what is expected of us. Look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, and we're going to look at verse 5 through 8. Romans chapter 6, verse 5 through 8 is where I want to start. And as I said, he, Christ, referred to the helper as the Holy Spirit, and we need the Holy Spirit to help us to live this new life in Christ so that we are able to do what is expected of us. The Bible talks about some things that is expected of us here in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 5 is where I'm going to start, and it says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall also uh, we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Go down to verse twelve. It says, "Okay, now that you understand that." Now that you understand how Christ's death relates to you as a child of God, it says, now, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. One thing about it, the only way sin will not have dominion over a child of God is if they are submitted to the Holy Spirit, the helper. He is the only one that will be able to help you to no longer walk in your own ways. And so in John 16, Jesus also referred to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, as the Spirit of Truth. He said, when He, the Spirit of Truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. When you think about it, a guide is a person who advises or shows the way to others. A guide is a thing that helps someone to form an opinion or make decisions. News flash. Let me tell you something, people of God. He, the Holy Spirit, he will show you. He will lead you. He will speak to you. But he won't do what only you can do. Can I say that one more time? Yes. He will guide you. He will lead you. He will speak to you. But he will not do what only you can do. He will lead you. But it is your job to obey his leading. He's not going to do it for you. But he will show you what 
that you need to do. And so everything with God is based on choice and not force. Everything with God is based on choice, not force. Since the beginning of time, when you go back and you look in the book of Genesis, in the garden, God has been revealing to his people what to do and what not to do. In the garden, he said, you can eat of this, but this right here, don't mess with this. At that moment, man was presented with some options. It was up to man to choose whether or not he was going to obey the voice of God. Same thing with the Holy Spirit. He will present options to us about what to do or what not to do, but it's up to us to choose whether or not we're going to obey the Holy Spirit. And when you think about God, when you think about the Holy Spirit, when you think about Jesus Christ, will they ever lead you on the wrong path? Not at all. But sometimes we don't choose what's right. And so we have to understand that in the garden, God spoke with man and he walked with them. We understand that when Jesus Christ was walking on the earth, he was that voice that was needed in the earth realm that was speaking to his followers, that was pouring into the people. But how many of y'all know Jesus ain't here no more? And so now we have something internal. We have something that lives on the inside of us. Our help is now internal. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is where? In you. Whom you have from God and you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body, in your spirit, which are God's. This not even yours. It belongs to God. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So you have an internal help on the inside of you. There is a piece of God that lives inside your wretched flesh. Your wretched flesh that never gets saved. And so when you think about it, you got something on the inside of you that is so powerful that it is able to control that wretched flesh of yours if you would just simply submit. And so the Holy Spirit's mission in the world is to convict the unsaved of their sins. There was a point in time when the Holy Spirit, and you ain't even know nothing about the Holy Spirit, hello? You ain't know nothing about the third person of the Trinity. But guess what? There was a point in time in your life as an unbeliever where the Holy Spirit was able to speak to your spirit, getting you to a place where you realized you needed to change. And so the Holy Spirit's mission in the world is to convict the unsaved of their sins and their need for a Savior. We are saved today because we were able to tap into the prompting of the Holy Spirit that made us know that we needed the Lord. And so that's one of his missions here in the earth, to convict the unsaved of their sins and their need for a Savior, and to indwell in those who are saved. Again, the Holy Spirit, he will not seize control by force, even though he longs to control us. He won't seize it by force, even though he longs to control us. When he is in control, you can know without a shadow of doubt that he will lead you in the right direction and he will choose the best for your life. He will show you the right decisions that you need to make when he's in control of your life. And what he wants for you is always, somebody say always. Always. Opposite of what your flesh wants. Okay? You need to understand that. Whatever the Holy Spirit wants for you, it is totally opposite of what your flesh wants. So let's talk about control, because I said that he wants control. And so when you think about that word control, a lot of times we don't like that, amen? For real, we don't want nobody to 
control of us. That's just human nature. But he wants control. And so control means to exercise restraining or directing influence over. That word control means to have power over. It's just something in our wretched flesh. Don't like the fact that something or anybody can have power over us. But it's to have power over. It is the ability or power to decide or strongly influence the particular way in which something happens or how someone will behave. When you allow the Holy Spirit to have control over you, he will influence how you behave. He will have a strong influence in how you live your life and what it is that you're actually doing, even though he won't do it for you. But the influence is that powerful when you allow him to have control. And so he wants to control our lives. But oftentimes he cannot control our lives because we want to control our lives. Oh, he wants to, but he can't do it. A lot of times. Because we want to be in control. As I said already, it's human nature for us to want to be in control of our lives. And prior to Christ, guess what, y'all? We thought we was in control. Yep. See, because when we get saved, now it's like, I don't want nobody to control me. I don't want, you know, we don't want the control of the Holy Spirit for real. Because we were so used to doing what we wanted to do. And how many of y'all know we thought we was in control of our life prior to Christ? But I'm here to tell you that guess what? You wasn't. There was something that was influencing you. Amen? And so we thought we were in control and did what we wanted to do. Not knowing that we were actually being controlled by the enemy. See, because either you're being controlled by God or you're being controlled by the enemy when it comes to your spiritual life. And so when we was doing what we wanted to do, we thought we was in control. Oh, no, there was somebody else that was influencing our behavior and what it is that we actually did. And so guess what? He, the enemy, will guide you. But guess what? He wouldn't do it for you. Even the enemy would guide you and lead you and speak to you about certain things. But he wouldn't do it for you. He just presented it. And you just simply did what he wanted you to do. Satan, the enemy, would lead you into temptation. Temptation is an enticement or invitation to sin. With the implied promise, it ain't nothing but a lie. That's what that implied promise is, amen? But temptation is an enticement, enticement or invitation to sin with the implied promise of greater good to be delivered from following the way of disobedience. The way of disobedience. Making you think in so many situations that doing this thing is going to bring you so much joy and pleasure. Uh-huh. See, that's how the devil likes to trick your mind. The devil like to get in your mind and entice you with some stuff and make you think. Well, see, guess what? This this wasn't good for you. But guess what? This right here, this is what you need to do because this is going to bring you joy. This is what's going to make you happy. This is what you need in your life. This is what you're missing. So guess what? The devil will show you that the grass is green on the other side. Promising you that if you just come over to this lawn, baby, everything will be all right. And you get over there on that lawn and you realize there's more problems over there than what you got in your own backyard. And so, he likes to give you an implied promise. And so you have to understand that Satan, the enemy, he only presents the temptation. <laughs> but he does not make you give in to it. He does not make you bite the bait that he dangles before you. Come in, Mark. And everybody else, some people, come in, Mark, because I'm the devil. I'm the devil. And this right here is temptation. This is the bait. This thing good right here, though. It's good. Take that real quick. <laughs> you see me? 
Yüçeli. Yüksel Yüçeli. Yüşadi. Yüzük de bey. I said, I'm the devil. And I waved it around. Did the devil make you do that? No, You did. And guess what? You see how quickly you ain't think? That's how we are for real. And that's how we end up falling into things. Because the bait is always dangled. But we're the one that bite. And the devil ain't always straight up like I was just now. I was straight up and said what this is. And you was like, okay. <laughs> you go have a seat. I, I couldn't do that for anybody else because most of the people in here, they know that. Amen. <laughs> but I just had to use that example because that's how easily we fall in temptation. That's how easily we give in to it. Because he presents the bait, but we are the ones that actually bite. And so we want to be in control, but we, we want to be in control in every single area of our life. But we have to get to a point where we realize we need to submit to the control of the Holy Spirit. And so, some people struggle more with being in control than others. See, I know me. I know my personality type. And the reality of it is, I am a strong cleric woman. And if anybody knows anything about the temperaments, clerics are individuals that like to be in control. And so, for real, sometimes you have some individuals that are real strong and want to be more in control than others, and God got to have a way of really getting their attention. But I can say today that I'm submitted. I can say today that he's in control. But when you are really one that's strong and like to be in control, it's hard for God to even be in control of your life and to move. It's hard for you to submit to him because when you're in control, you know, you feel like you got this. You know, you have to do this. You have to handle this. That's why some people don't like riding with other people. Because <laughs> they want to be in control. I ain't totally delivered in that area yet. I'm going to just be honest. Because guess what? When I'm driving, I can control the speed. I can control the brakes. I can control when I'm jumping over to this lane or that lane. But when somebody else is driving, oh, it's hard. And so some people, you can go to one spot, you got five people driving all their cars. Because all the people want to be in control and nobody want to just sit back and let somebody else take the wheel. And so, some people struggle more with, or more than anybody when it comes down to being in control. Even the Holy Spirit. They struggle with leaders. They struggle with spouses. They struggle with bosses. They struggle with basically everybody, even God. Why? Because of the R word. What is the R word, Mary? Do you know that word? I know. You don't know? Does anybody know what the possible R word is, Jasmine? Rebellion. Come on, put your hands together. She got the right answer. <laughs> A lot of times people struggle more with being in control with anybody, and including the Holy Spirit, because of rebellion. Ooh, this definition right here, because you know the average rebellious person don't think they're rebellious. Yo, let me tell you something. There was some rebellious stuff that was being shot out in the atmosphere when we was in Bible study. Amen? Okay? And I'm going to tell you, somebody, I was talking to a young lady who doesn't live in this uh, city. She lives in North Carolina. She was watching the Bible study. And she was like, I just wanted to just start typing the whole thing and say, won't you just stop being rebellious? Sometimes you just need to just lay out in the presence of the Lord. You don't need to know every single thing. Why is it that you got to just come against what has already been established? <laughs> rebellious people don't say it like that. <laughs> and so can I tell you what the definition of rebellion is? Please do Rebellion is the action or process of resisting authority. It is the action or process of resisting control. Here's the kicker right here, y'all. I ain't never even heard this word before until I looked at this de definition. It is rebellion is the action or process of resisting convention. 
Now let me tell you what convention is. <laughs> convention is a way in which something is usually done, especially within a particular area. Oh, if they lay prostrate in the Bible, it was something that was usually done. Why we got to have a fight about laying before the law? We have a fight because you're rebellious. And so rebellion is the actual process of resisting convention, a way in which something is usually done. And anybody else tuned in, they may have seen, well, I'm going to tell you straight up, I just don't do what everybody else do. But anyway, a way in which something is usually done, especially within a particular area or activity. Convention is a custom way of acting and doing things that is widely accepted and followed. One thing about it, this right here, you ain't got to fight about what's done in here. Just do it. You don't have to fight about what's done in the Word if you believe that this is God's Word. There are some things in the world you just don't want to go along with. But when it comes down to God and His Word and things that have been set up and established, why we got to fight? Oftentimes because we're rebellious. We want to be in control. We want to do it our way. Look at your neighbor. And say to your neighbor, neighbor. neighbor. Say neighbor. neighbor. Pull over. Pull over. Pull over. Get in the back seat. Get in the back seat. And let the spirit drive. Find another neighbor and tell another neighbor. Say neighbor. So you can't really talk about the joy that I have and 
You can't really understand the excitement when it comes down to the things of God. You can't really understand the peace that some believers have. And that's because you, child of God, you have not given the Holy Spirit control. You're saved. But who's controlling you? Because when he's controlling you, I promise you, life is good. No matter what goes on, life is good when he's in control. And so, people of God, it's time to make a change. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians. Y'all know I heard this out. It's time. Come on, turn to Ephesians 5. Time to make a change. We are his people. You can do it. I may have said it wrong. Come on. Ephesians chapter 5 is what I want us to look at. Amen. Because people of God, it is time to make a change. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 is where we're going to stop. Bless the Lord. Uh, Vanessa, I see you on today. Robert Pop, Robert Tate, thank you for tuning in. Elder Sean and uh, Collins, McKay, and Teresa, I'm glad that you all are tuning in. Bless you, Shirley Kenny, your old faithful online. And so, people of God, it's time for us to make a change. And as I said, some people can't see the joy of a surrendered life because they haven't yielded to the control of the Holy Spirit, even though he lives in them, even though they're born again. And so we need to do some things different. It's time to make a change. Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 15, the word of God says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as what? Fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time. Because a lot of us have wasted a whole bunch of time living as fools in times past. But he said, see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do you want to know what the will of the Lord is for your life, child of God? If so, it's about to tell us what the will of the Lord is. Here it is in a second. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. When you think about that word dissipation, it means overindulgence, wasteful use. It means debauchery, which is immoral behavior. And so... The Amplified Version of verse 18, it says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is wickedness, corruption, stupidity. But be filled with the Holy Spirit and constantly guided by Him. See, that's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It means to be constantly guided by Him on a day-to-day Minute-by-minute basis. Not just when you need them. See, because a lot of times we reach out to them when we feel as though we need them, but all the other time, I got this God. No, he needs to constantly guide your life, the Holy Spirit. i never forget some years ago, because the way we deal with the Holy Spirit, i never forget this joke I said this one time. It was supposed to have been a man of God, and yes, he was a man of God. Men of God had issues too. Women of God had issues too. But this was supposed to have been a man of God that, that, that so-called had an interest in me many years ago. And I'll never forget the first time this individual came to visit me, I was so turned off. I was so turned off because what I saw was totally different when the individual came to visit me. And it amazed me because I was like, hold the bus, young man. I'm not even down with this. And then I was in a different place in my life. And I said, what's up with your Holy Spirit? What's up with the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of you? Why are you doing all this? Y'all want to know what that man told me? He said, it's like a light switch. I turn it on and off. Turn it on when I need to. Turn it off when I want to. And a lot of times, that's how we are with the Holy Spirit. See, when we do what we want to do, we ain't in tune to him. We ain't seeking him for what we want, what he want to do in our life. But, oh, let something fall down in your life. Let something happen. Now, all of a sudden, you want to turn them on. Holy Spirit, I need you. Holy Spirit, I want you to talk to me. Now you want to pray. When the angel's good, you ain't find time to pray. But now you want to get into his face. We like to use him. But when you are filled with the Spirit, 
the word of God says that you are constantly guided by him. When you think about drunks, because it talks about don't be drunk. When you think about a person that's drunk, drunks are controlled by the alcohol. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can blame it on the alcohol. Because drunks oftentimes are controlled by the alcohol in their systems. That's why they say certain things. Oh, if they were sober, they may not say it. But now that they got their juice up in them, they will say certain things. Oh, they'll do certain things. They'll go certain places because the alcohol is controlling them. It affects the way you think. You don't think the same when you're drunk. It affects the way you think. Sober-minded, he look like the crust on your feet. <laughs> Sober, but no, drunk, he look like somebody that you think is nice looking. Because it affect how you think. It affect how, that's a person sometimes you wouldn't even get in the time of day, but drunk, you'll wake up with him the next morning. Uh-huh, where my drunk said in the house, raise your hand, don't be shy inside. <laughs> 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 but the bottom line is, for real drunks, I mean, you know, some of us, some of us that's been drunk, we know for real. Oh, yeah. The stuff we did when we was drunk under the control of that alcohol, we would never do it in our right mind. Lord Jesus, it affects the way a person thinks. It affects the way they speak. It affects the way they walk. It affects the way that they act. When you just visualize all of that, a person is drunk, all of those areas of their life are affected because they are controlled by the alcohol that's in this system. Likewise, if we are controlled by the Holy Spirit, he will affect how we think, how we speak, how we walk, and how we act. Hmm. Some of the stuff you do, you really got to ask yourself, am I really controlled by the Holy Spirit? When you think about some of the stuff that come out your mouth, when you think about some of the things that you think, when you think about your walk with Christ, when you think about how you act, is the Holy Spirit really controlling you? So think about how, you, how you've been living your life. Think about it. Have you been walking according to the Holy Spirit? Or have you been walking in the flesh? Galatians chapter 5. I want to read this from the Living Bible. Amen. The Living Bible. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 is where I'm going to start. And as I say, for real, think about all the areas that the Holy Spirit controls. It controls how you think. It can control how you speak. The Holy Spirit can control your walk. It control how you act. Just like alcohol can do the same thing. And so we got to be honest. Have I been controlled by the Holy Spirit or have I been controlled by my flesh? Have I been controlled by the tempter of my flesh? And so Galatians chapter 5 verse 16, the word of God says, I advise you to obey only, only the Holy Spirit's instruction. Because the Holy Spirit is the only one that's going to lead you on the right path. The other voice is contrary to what you need to do. And so it says, I advise you to obey only the Holy Spirit's instruction. He will tell you where to go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you about to jump in your car, and you about to go ahead. Guess what? Before you even get in your car, if your Holy Ghost is on point, your Holy Ghost going to speak to you. And can I tell you, he speaks. We just don't always want to hear what he got to say. But the Holy Ghost will tell you, don't go there. Sometimes the Holy Ghost will tell you, make a right turn. But no, Mr. or Mrs., I want to be in control. Why would you want me to make a right turn? I always go this way. This is the way I've been going all along, so why do I need to change and go another way now? I'm going to go straight. Okay, go straight and sit in traffic for five hours because of a major accident. He was trying to be in control to tell you to turn right, but you got to know everything. You got to be in control instead of listening to the Holy Spirit. And so, it goes on to say, uh, okay, y'all know me, I got distracted. <laughs> All right. Okay. Somebody give me a tissue. 
It's an ant. It's just an ant, but I don't want to crawl around it. Y'all know me. All right, come on. Come on, Dick. You're moving a little slow. Okay? And so, yes, he's just crawling all over the pulpit right now. I need him gone. All right, and so it says, I advise you to obey only the Holy Spirit's instructions. He will tell you where to go and what to do. And then you will always be doing the wrong things your evil nature wants you to do. Hello. When we gonna catch that revelation, we keep doing foolish, stupid stuff that don't line up with God because we're not listening to the instruction of the Holy Spirit. But he says he will tell you where to go. He will tell you what to do. Then you won't always be doing the wrong things your evil nature wants you to. For we naturally, somebody say naturally. naturally. Oh yeah, we naturally love to do evil things. We just love it. It comes natural. We don't even have to think about it. It's like second nature. We naturally love to do evil things that are just the opposite from the things that the Holy Spirit tells us to do. And the good things we want to do when the Spirit has his way with us are just the opposite of our natural desires. These two forces within us, not on the outside, because guess what? The outside will be the outside. Just like when the woman was praying this morning, and she said, when you open up your eyes, guess what? Your circumstances around you may not change, but your thinking can you have to understand that the battle that we deal with is on the inside of us. The stuff that's going on around us will always be there. But there comes a point in time when we make up in our mind that those things are no longer going to have control over me because I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to have control over me. But these two forces are always at odds against each other, constantly fighting each other to win control over us. And our wishes are never free from their pressures. You will go through this until the day you die and come out of this wretched body. But you have to always be mindful, child of God, that the Spirit of God wants control of your life. And so does the enemy who works on your flesh. When you are guided, guided by the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth. He will lead you. When you are guided by the Holy Spirit, you need no longer to force yourself to obey Jewish law. Because guess what? You hear his voice. You ain't got to go through the Ten Commandments and try to keep them anymore because you hear his voice because he's been on the inside of you. It says, but when you follow your own wrong inclinations, your lives will produce these evil results. You will see right now if you are controlled by something other than the Holy Spirit if these things are active in your life. It says impure thoughts. You want to know some of the signs? Yeah, impure thoughts. Eagerness for lustful pleasure. Idolatry. Spiritism. That is encouraging the activity of demons. Hatred and fighting. Jealousy and anger. Constant effort to get the best for yourself because it's all about me and what I want. Complaints and criticism. The feeling that everyone else is wrong except those in your own little group. And there will be wrong doctrine. Envy, murder, drunkenness, wild parties and all the sort of things. Let me tell you again, as I've said before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's not talking about you going to heaven. The kingdom of God right here on this earth. You can have the blessed peace of God right here on this earth. But I promise you, if you engage in drunkenness, if you engage in wild parties, if you engage in spiritism, if you engage in idolatry, if you engage in lustful pleasures, if you engage in all those things, you will not have what God has for you. And so, in order for the spirit to have control, you must present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That's the only way that the Holy Spirit can control your life is if you present yourself to him. You need to be able to say, here I am, Lord. 
You need to be able to say, I give myself away. You need to be able to say, Holy Spirit, have your way. God, your will be done. So let's talk briefly before, as we prepare to close, but let's talk briefly about some areas in our lives that the Holy Spirit wants to control. First of all, he wants to control your lips. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. That little treacherous hole in your face. He wants to be able to control your lips. Your mouth can kill or it can build up. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Ephesians 4.29, it tells us, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Do you all realize that more damage is done by uncontrolled lips than by any other single tool of the devil? You have individuals today that are 60 years old that are still messed up because of some things that some foolish person spoke out of their mouths. We used to say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words would never hurt me. No, people are messed up because of words. People feel like they have no value because of words of individuals. People have been torn down, insecure, insecure and some, because of words that have been spoken. People feel like they're gonna always be a failure because somebody has said to them, you'll never be nothing. Watch your mouth. Watch the things you say out of your mouth because people are messed up, broken, bruised and hurt because of words. When you open your mouth, it should bring glory to God. You shouldn't sound like the sailor on the corner, but yet many saints do with your cussing sales. Shut it down. All the foul talk. Stop cussing. Typing is cussing. Putting the little, X, the little stars and all that other stuff, leaving out the letters. Saints of God do this. And they really think that they ain't cussing. Bottom line is don't allow any corrupt communication to come out of your mouth or out of your fingertips in this world of social media. Something else that the Holy Spirit wants to control. He wants control of our hearts and our minds. When you think about it, your heart refers to your inner man. It is the part of you that thinks. It is the part of you that feels. It is the part of you that decides. You present yourself first as a living sacrifice. Then the next part of Romans chapter 12 verse 2 can come into play. Because if you keep in, in mind that your heart and mind, the part of you that thinks, feels, and decides, after you present yourself as a living sacrifice, part 2 in chapter uh, 12 verse 2, the verse now deals with your mind. After you present, now you need to transform your mind. After you present yourself as a living sacrifice, now you need to deal with your stinking thinking. And so, the heart and the mind work together. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. The CEV version, contemporary English version says, Carefully guard your thoughts. Guard your thoughts when you by yourself. Guard your thoughts. Because those things you think nobody can see, God knows your filthy thoughts. The Holy Spirit wants control of your mind and your thoughts. The Holy Spirit wants to control our hearts and our minds to help us to control. Because when we allow him to control this area, then it will help us to control our thoughts, our desires and attitudes. He is aware of where most sin begins. The Holy Spirit, God, and Jesus Christ is totally aware of where most sin begins. And guess what? It begins in the mind. Proper thoughts will produce proper actions. Improper thoughts will produce improper actions. And again, 
The devil cannot make anybody sin. He can't make you do nothing. Another person can't make you do nothing. God is not going to make you do nothing. Anything you do is because you have made a conscious, a conscious. conscious. You have made a conscious decision to do it. And when the Holy Spirit is not in control of your mind and in your heart, you will make conscious decisions to do what's contrary to God. When the Holy Spirit controls your heart and your mind, guess what? You'll be more like Christ. You'll be more Christ-like. And he wants to control our desires. Uh-huh. Desires. Desire is a strong feeling of wanting to have something or wishing for something to happen. There is an internal battle for control of desires in the life of every believer. There's a true battle. Understand that an internal battle of control for the desires in the life of every believer. The spirit battles against the flesh, meaning that old man. So that stuff your old flesh desired is still there. There's a battle. But you got to allow the Holy Spirit to control that desire, those wicked desires. And so uncontrolled desires have put many men in trouble in the past. Women too, but I'm just going to tell you some things about some men in the Bible who had desires that were not controlled by the Holy Spirit. And it caused them problems. And so David desired another man's wife. He desired somebody other than his wife because David was a married man. Hello? David already had a wife, but he wanted somebody else's wife. He desired somebody else that he wasn't supposed to have. He should have been loving on his own wife's breast. That's what the Bible tells us in Proverbs. The wife of your youth. And so David desired another man's wife. Achan desired the gold and silver of Jericho. Sometimes we can desire stuff so much that it'll get us out the will of God. Hello, we desire stuff so much it get us out the will of God. That's why some people don't go to church because they got to work, 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 work. Let me say your work, 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 work. Because all the stuff that they want to get. So Achan, he desired some stuff that he wasn't supposed to have. The unforbidden things. It got him in trouble. You had Gehazi who desired the wealth of Naaman. You had Gehazi, his servant, who desired the wealth of Naaman. So he went back and told the lot to try to get the money that the man of God said, I don't want it. I don't need it. But he was say, oh, no, he does want it. No, he was going back in trickery, his desires. You want to let them, how you going to turn that down? They about to pay you $1,000. You don't want that? The prophet said, no. Hazel, I was like, man, he must be tricky. And guess what? Because I serve the man of God, if I go back and tell them that the prophet changed his mind, they'll believe me because I walk with the man of God. Gehazi desired the wealth of Naaman. And Judas desired 30 pieces of silver. And so we need to understand that the Holy Spirit wants to control our desires. And he also wants to control our bodies. We already saw that our bodies are not our own. So when we allow the Holy Spirit to control our lips, when we allow the Holy Spirit to control our heart, when we allow the Holy Spirit to control our mind and our desires, how many of y'all know that the body will line up? The body will have no other choice but to fall in line with everything else when the Holy Spirit has control in those areas of your life. And so the Holy Spirit is our comforter. He is our guide. He is our teacher. He is our helper. He is our friend. And we need to learn to willingly give him our lives in complete and total surrender in every area. Only then, people of God, will we really experience the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He wants control, but he can only take control of those who are yielded to him. I want
want you all to be honest with yourself and only if you desire change. Because some people can be honest with where they really are, but they don't desire change. But I want you to be honest with yourself today. And if you are an individual that you know that there are some areas in your life that you know you need to allow the Holy Spirit to have control over. You know, he hasn't been in control in them areas. But yet you realize you want to surrender to him. I want you to come to this altar on today. Because there's something that the Lord put in my spirit, and I believe that it will be a blessing. So, you know. But if that's you, and you know he ain't really been in control of your life like that, I need you at the altar. Is there one? At the altar. One of the things that I want you to understand about the altar is that the altar is a place when they used to offer sacrifices at the altar, a lot of times they would alter those sacrifices for the sins of the people. Anytime we're not allowing God to control our lives, we are operating in direct sin against the Lord. But we realize that there are some areas that we need him to be in control of. And so I want you to give it to God. Whatever it is that you've been trying to control, I want you to give it to him and just allow these words to minister to your spirit as you stand there. Let him have all of you, every area of your life. Yes, Lord God. Lord, I Minister to your people as they stand at this altar on today's Lord God.